Clem, let's start with absolutely, in my opinion, the most important question of the session. Are we going to run out of food? Hmm. That's a good question, Dale. Um, several numbers have been put forward and you picked up on the 60 years left of harvest. Um, I think what is for sure known is that um, the question behind this is at the pace at which we are degrading soil, agricultural soil, there is definitely a threat for us to be able to feed the world population in a short term. This is certain. Um, what is the exact number of years left? Um, we don't know, but what is for sure, we've already degraded a third of our agricultural land, and it takes a thousand years to build three centimeters of topsoil. A thousand years to yeah. rebuild topsoil. So it's, it's time to, uh, to take you know, uh, stock of these numbers and, um, and act differently. Absolutely. So, that, so you referenced there um, a statistic that we had in the session uh, introduction, which was that there is 60 years of food left, or 60 harvests left. Maybe, Yap, I can turn to you. Um, Clem mentioned that that's to do with uh, this thing called soil degradation. Can, yeah. you, can you maybe elaborate on, on what that means? Sure. Um, it's basically the process um, that is a result from, to a large extent, the, uh, the kind of agriculture uh, practices that we have these days, um, which are a combination of different let's say issues, um, both the chemical inputs that we use combined with um, what's called monocropping. So you're basically using one produce the whole time um, uh, combined with uh, tillage that, that disturbs the soil. So it's really a, a sum of a compound effect of multiple different things coming together that um, in many cases is indeed reducing soil quality uh, and, and erosion. Uh, the other thing indeed is this, this thing called erosion is also um, you know, soil that's being washed away uh, because of, of yeah, it's not holding the water anymore and so it's being, being eroded. Um, and climate change actually is also impacting negatively the soil quality. Clem, do you have anything to add to that soil degradation? Yeah, actually on the point of climate change, I think what's important to realize is that we definitely need soil to feed ourselves. 95% of our food is coming from soil. But I think we should not also uh, overlook the role that soil has in fighting climate change. Um, soil is required to sequester carbon. Um, and the less soil, the less ability to sequester carbon. And this is obviously creating a vicious cycle and um, that is preventing us to fight food, uh, climate change. And you are um, together are working on a, a, a project at the moment that is examining this issue, this enormous kind of complex system, but you've narrowed it down to uh, cities. You're focusing in on cities. Can you give me a bit of an idea of why, Clem, perhaps you've chosen to look at cities? Yeah. Um, so we see cities as a powerful entry point uh, to start um, influencing the food system. So cities by 2050 will be uh, places where 80% of the global food will be consumed. They are also massive generators of organic waste and, and this waste can you know, become a threat to citizens or it can become a wealth according to how you treat it. Um, so there's no question that cities have a massive power to um, shift the way we are thinking and, and doing with food. Um, we also recognize that cities are the place where trends emerge, innovations are tested, things, new things are experimented. Um, so if there is a need to redesign the food system, that's probably um, in cities that it will start. That's our bet. So you said, so 80% so of food is, is, will be consumed in cities. Sorry, Arp, I interrupted you there, but I'm going to come to you with a question quickly about not the consumption of food, but the growing of food. How much kind of food is currently grown in cities? <clears throat> and what is the potential for more food to be grown in cities? Um, well, the exact numbers are not always easy to guess by to, no. to understand how much is grown in cities, but it's, it's clearly a very relatively small amount. Um, what we did find, which wasn't that straightforward or intuitive, is basically that actually a significant proportion of food is grown near cities and within 10 to 20 kilometers. We found that basically 40 percent of agriculture land sits within 20 kilometers of cities globally, uh, which was a lot more than we realized. So, you know, that linkage is there. Um, it's not so much really within the cities itself, although arguably there is, of course, it, it is happening uh, in different different ways. Um, now the potential that you asked about, I mean, we, we did look into that um, quite a bit. And 
uh, particularly also on the whole momentum around this thing called urban agriculture, urban farming, um, which of course is, is quite a hot topic. Also, when you look into technology innovations at the indoor farms and the vertical farms, which you hear a lot about. I mean, one of the, it's, it's hard to say what, you know, how big it exactly will, will become. I mean, it, it definitely has a role to play, but ultimately it's in, in a, in a, in a food, future food system that actually starts to live a bit more within uh, the limits um, that it's going, it's, that, is, that it's not today. It's quite hard to see how inner city food growing would be a substantial part of it. Um, and it's actually for a variety of reasons. Uh, on the one hand, obviously competing for space um, with other uh, good uses that are quite, sometimes quite scarce in cities. Um, also, the more, let's say, um, technology, the technology heavy you go, uh, the more vertical farm you go, the more there are still questions around the total energy use for it. And is that really the, the, the best way to do that? Um, and therefore, also the economics of it are, aren't that straightforward yet. So, you know, uh, when you think about, you know, can cities become, you know, completely self-sufficient? Um, I'm sure there's some good cases to be made for city states like, let's say, Singapore, who are going quite hard on it and, and, and others. Um, so from that perspective, yes. But, you know, when you really look globally overall, um, it's, it makes a lot more sense to actually fix what we have now, which is the current agriculture system and, and really work with that. I think about what you should do there also from a city perspective yeah absolutely mm. so that again kind of points out the complexity of the system the fact that you can kind of aim to make a change directly in the city but the system is so big and complex that it's certainly not going to be the only place that you can look at yeah Clem coming back you mentioned uh, the the waste that's produced in cities is one of the reasons why it's kind of a point of focus and a place where change can happen perhaps quickly what is it about this waste that kind of is exciting from this project's point of view? Uh, where to start? <laughs> Very interesting topic, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, look, I think um, you have to look at it from two different angles. The first one is um, waste by itself has a lot of value, uh, especially linking back to agriculture. So we say lots of organic waste are piling up in cities, um, and we actually need these valuable nutrients to grow the food that we need for tomorrow to avoid this food gap that you started the session with. Um, so there's a lot of phosphorus and uh, nitrogen that can be found in these organic waste streams and they can be channeled back to the agriculture. And that will allow us to put ourselves um, on track with the planetary boundaries concepts um, for phosphorus and nitrogen. That's one side of, of the equation. On the other side, we, if we take the sand from cities, organic waste are a huge cost bucket for cities to deal with. And, um, and this is threatening uh, citizens' self as Yap uh, alluded to uh, earlier on. So there's really, um, it, it's definitely a win-win for the city to valorize this waste one way or another, mm. uh, put it back in the bioeconomy, may, maybe in agriculture, maybe in something else. Um, and, and, and it's basically something that really has to be done considering the ramping you know, rate of urbanization yeah. and yeah, the increased amount of food that we're going to consume in cities. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer for cities doing this. If they can save money on their waste and if it's going to contribute to the health of our food system. Yeah. I mean, are, are there cities out there that are already doing this? Are there some examples that are leading the way? Yeah, definitely. Um, if you look at Milan, for example, it is a well-known um, case example of a city that has successfully um, scaled up a organic um, collection for or a collection, a separate collection scheme for organic waste. I think we are close to 80% of organic waste being collected through this scheme, uh, which is which is enormous and which is you know uh, enabling all sorts of valorization downstream. Uh, so I mentioned there regenerative agriculture. Uh, we talked about soil degradation and the fact that it's kind of really difficult to get the quality of that soil back up to the, nece the necessary quality. Uh, we've talked about reconnecting cities and the nutrients that are currently being wasted within uh, cities' waste streams back to that soil, um, which makes me think of something that I've heard of a few times, obviously working in this space a bit, this regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. What is that? Yeah. Regenerative agriculture is a set of farming practices that aims to um, actually farm and produce food while at the same time nurturing and restoring natural capital and particularly soil. Um, the way we grow food currently is, is, tends to be uh, you know, degrading soil, um, taking carbon out of soil 
um, more than it actually put it back. Um, so I think um, regenerative agriculture is really aiming at uh, providing a different dynamic around, uh, around soil and around soil uh, degradation. Super. We've had a question in from the audience, uh, which I'm going to direct to you first, Yap, but I'd like to get Clem's perspective as well. Um, obviously, that statistic that you shared earlier about um, how long it takes to rebuild soil health um, is quite a frightening one. And we had a question on the ThinkDiff website, someone saying, is it even possible to undo the damage that it takes, uh, to undo the damage if it takes a thousand years to rebuild one centimeter? So is there, is there hope? <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here either. No, um, there is. And, and, and there, it is actually very much linked to the discussion we just started, which is there are um, practices, and it's really about practice, it's not about technological innovations or whatnot, but, but uh, different ways of treating um, land can actually speed up the, the soil health restoration, the, the, the regeneration substantially. Um, and, um, and, and the examples that are typically given are, in, in, instead of this monocropping that we talked about before, um, switching to multicropping, which basically forces the soil to grow different species over time, which, um, uh, which tends to kind of really improve the health and the diversity and the, the biodiversity within the soil. Um, and so there are many other examples of what you could do to actually uh, improve the soil health. Um, and the interesting thing I always find, it's, it's all there, it's, it's, it's been done, um, and there's nothing you know, new to it. We're, we're not talking about massive revolution in terms of technology. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, we, it, it can be done. Yep, you mentioned that it's, these kind of practices are not new necessarily. Um, if so, why, why are there not more farmers doing this? The logical next question, I guess. Um, you know, so, uh, in, in part, also, I mean, in all honesty, the um, the reality of, of the, the yield that it gives um, it, it varies sometimes a bit. Um, I think, in the, but the, the reason why we kind of went down the path that we did was also because of uh, the the kind of incremental system that we build around it of um, you know supporting growth with with chemical inputs that indeed showed very positive results which then led to basically more support around that. I mean, there, there are many examples all over the world where basically governments are actively subsidizing that, uh, where they are subsidizing monocropping in emerging countries, emerging markets, is still quite a lot the case. Um, and, you know, historically, again, for all good reasons, um, it's just, you know, only the last 10, 20, maybe 30 years do we realize that that's maybe not a path we can continue to go down. And so that's why you do see a renewed interest, I would say, um, into, okay, well, what are alternatives? Uh, where indeed, when you then look around you, you realize that there are very good examples out there that work. Now, the question still, still remains, does it work at scale? And do we still have enough you know, food to feed the population and, and uh, kind of solving all the issues at once? Uh, and to, in all honesty, the jury is out on that one. I think it's just hard to really project how that's going to play out. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah. it is early stage for Regenike to, uh, um, you know, to spread. And I think with time we'll be able to uh, to tell, you know, yes. like can we actually reach a stage where we are producing the same yields with regenerating than with conventional farming? Um, so there's, like I was saying, there's still a way to go, but it is definitely the path that we have to take. I think to me, when I, you know, envision the future food system, I see something where um, every meal has the potential to fulfill uh, people's health provide them with the nutrition, the energy that they require, while at the same time nurturing natural systems and the bioeconomy, economy as a whole. Um, agriculture should be diverse, it should be regenerating soil, it should be a carbon sink, sequestering carbon, um, and it should, not, uh, it should not pollute air or water. Uh, by contrast, it should be you know, cleaning air and water, and it should, also, um, it should also support biodiversity, which is a point that we haven't really discussed, but is also really uh, yeah. important. Um, and I think, um, so, so that's for the agricultural side of things. When it comes to what people eat, um, their food should be, again, diverse. It should rely on different sources of proteins, um, some of them you know, being alternative sources of protein. Uh, sourcing locally and regeneratively as much as possible, making sure that food waste is prevented whenever avoidable, and when it's not avoidable, organic waste should be valorized to become a revenue stream more than a costly waste stream. Um, and all of that should be enabled by you know, scientific advancements, technology, innovation. 
um, and as we discussed, policy and, um, and, and financial instruments have a key role to play.